What's good, everybody? It's your host, Earl of Pearl, man. Episode 7 of the Ultimate 216 Show. Breaking news, and I got a goat with me to break it all down. All that coming up and more. Welcome to Episode 7 of the Ultimate 216 Show. Wasn't going to waste no time, man. Second guest ever joining me, somebody that I've been really, really eager to work with. My man, Quincy Carrier, content creator, covering all things Browns, Cavs, and the AFC North. My man got over 42,000 subscribers on YouTube. If you're not subscribed, man, swing over there, subscribe, ring the bell, stay notified of what Quincy got going on. Salute to you, King. What's going on, brother? Good, man. Good. You know, just been waiting out this free agency period. It seems like it's slowed down, but you know, AB, he's good for like a July free agency boom, Thanks. like out of nowhere. So, Thanks, you never know so let's, let's get you. into it, man. Right before we jumped in here, man, per multiple reports, I believe Adam Schefter had it first. The Browns just signed 25 year old Devin Bush to a one year contract, bro. Devin Bush, former first round pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers back in 2019, uh, towards ACL in 2020. Only had 37 tackles last year with the Seattle Seahawks. Initial thoughts, Devin Bush to the Cleveland Browns. Andrew Barry don't give up on, like, draft prospects that he likes. I think right. that's my biggest, like, takeaway is, okay, if he likes somebody in a draft and it makes sense to bring him in as a flyer, he's mm -hmm. all he's going to make that choice to go at them. I mean, this team is full of guys like that right where you look at elijah moore is another case like that jerry judy who they traded for is another move along those lines um even somebody like wyatt teller who he didn't bring in he stuck with because he probably liked him in the draft process david and joku another guy yeah. who tried yeah. to get out of here andrew barry liked them in the draft when he was here what in 2018 or 17 mm -hmm. um and stuck with it right deshaun watson Famously, somebody that Andrew Barry pushed for and then swung around and got. So he's all like, if you want to know where Andrew Barry is with free agency, you just got to look at who he likes when it came to when they came out. That's usually who he's going to be willing to kind of give a shot to. And Devin Bush, it fits that profile. It's probably a player Andrew Barry liked a lot, didn't like him enough to take him in the first round or anything like that. But, you know, now that he's available, you see if you can find a, a, a supporting role for him and maybe find a way to play him in a way that makes sense for him. And what his skill set is now, which is very different than what it was when he was coming out of Michigan. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. You know, just looking at the one year deal coming off a down year in Seattle, you would assume he's signing for probably the veterans minimum. Uh, a lot of what you said makes sense to me. You know, Andrew Berry, he loves guys that he once sought after in the draft. I think the man loved projects and giving people a second or a third opportunity to prove that they can play. And what ultimately ends up happening is that these dudes pan out and showing that they can just add anything to the Cleveland Browns and achieving an ultimate goal, then the Browns end up with a steal, right? Mm -hmm. Devin Bush is never probably going to be that superstar player that he was projected to be when he was drafted. But if he can turn out to be a serviceable role player and a guy that actually, you know, has his assignment, goes out there and execute and be productive, then that's another steal for the Cleveland Browns. Here's a guy that's, you know, like you said, it fits the mode, 24, 25 years old, um, has had some issues, whether it be injuries, on field, off the field, off the field maturity issues, et cetera. And Andrew Berry gets his hands on these type of players and hopefully like with the culture of the Cleveland Browns to be able to just to develop those dudes here. And it'd be really interesting to see, you know, what he can get out of uh, Devin Bush. I wouldn't I wouldn't look at this move as as, you know, being done addressing the linebacker position. But it's definitely a nice quality move for dudes who at one time had a lot of upside and a lot of potential. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be competing with Jacob Phillips, right, for that kind of a role there. They already had something carved out for Tony Fields. Um, mm -hmm. They signed Jordan Hicks to kind of replace what Anthony Walker was giving you. I think it's going to be between Jacob Phillips, who was fine until they moved them to Mike in 2022. Yeah. Um, 
and Devin Bush to kind of battle out for that wheel spot. That see only Taki Taki run thumper kind of role there because we know JOK is going to be taking over the middle. Um, and I think a lot of the moves that they've made at linebacker this year are about making sure that they can build around and put JOK in the best position possible to kind of lead this defense from a linebacker perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we had uh, DeAnthony Bell on our show about two weeks ago, and he, he he spoke highly about, you know, playing for Jim Schwartz, playing in this system. But he spoke more to about what year two and this system would look like when you understand the language, you understand where you need to be at on the field and how most of the guys that's returning on the side of the ball, they can definitely help, like, with the learning curve for the guys that's incoming. And I, I totally agree with you. I think everything is about, you know, building that linebacker room up to surround it, you know, with Jock to kind of exploit everything that he does um, very, very well. So I, I like the move. I, I'm still an advocate of I, I still want Jerome Baker. Maybe I'm being a little greedy here, but that's a dude that's from here. Uh, I don't know for sure if, you know, he wants to come home and try to contribute to the Cleveland Browns winning a, a Super Bowl. But I wouldn't stop at Devin Bush. I would try to see if I can get Jerome Baker as well. I think they're looking to draft too, right? There's the draft right. on the horizon. They might find a need to to add there. I honestly think that they they feel pretty set at linebacker. I mean, they haven't emphasized linebacker too much, right? Right. Uh, right. Throughout Andrew Barry's regime, and I think they're pretty set there with JOK. Got to remember, Grant Delpit fix figures into this linebacker conversation too, because he kind of does a little bit of both. So he's not just going to be somebody. It's not just JOK that they look as a difference maker. It's like Grant Delpit. They feel like can kind of go in there and make a difference they signed jordan hicks i think anybody else will be like kind of flyer deals like they're doing right now with devin bush i don't know if they feel the need to go out and get another starter i think they feel fine with having the competition between tony fields who they felt comfortable with letting them play a lot last year um and then jordan hicks i'm not jordan hicks um and Devin Bush and Jordan Jacob Phillips who remember they took in the third round so like they still kind of believe in him a little bit it's just man I mean what was it the same peck as before that he tore uh Jacob I I, I can't remember off the top of my head what his injury was I mean this, this is a out. duel like when he the few times that we've seen him on a football field you know you you can see the sideline the sideline speed you can see the great coverage skills and things like that but the best ability is availability. Mm -hmm. uh, if the Browns, you know, really wanted to bring him back on a one-year flyer to see what he can do healthy, I'm definitely not opposed to that at all. You know, you mentioned Jordan Hicks, and I think Jordan Hicks signing, when you talk about the development of Jock, and, you know, you got a guy like like Devin Bush coming in. You you have Tony Fields. Here's a guy that that's a veteran that's had a lot of success who's played in Jim Schwartz's system. And to me, you know, I kind of marry this like I do with the Amari Cooper and, and Jerry Judy pairing. This is a dude who can teach these young linebackers the system and kind of mold Jock into that next quote unquote him dude, you know, before he actually moves on into retirement. And so I thought that was another great pickup by Andrew Berry, uh, a, a signing that really made sense for the Cleveland Browns based on our own situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was a, another kind of Andrew Barry style signing where he just waited, signed somebody for fair value and kind of just moved on from there. Um, but yeah, Jordan Hicks, I think, you know, he's a he's a tackle guy. He is kind of an all round linebacker, not necessarily going to be somebody who makes a ton of plays, but somebody who's going to, you know, be there, be in the direction of a lot of these plays, be somebody who is a safety valve. If somebody gets through a gap that they're not supposed to, he might not make the tackle, but he will slow down somebody so a Grant or Jock can get over there and make the tackle. So yeah, it, it, he, he's going to be one of them pieces where it's probably a good thing if we're not talking about him that much right. because his game is not supposed to be very talkative, because. you know? Yeah, big facts, big facts. So just looking at this entire, you know, offseason, we can throw the Jerry Judy acquisition via trade in there. But looking at everything that Andrew Berry has done from Monday to now, you know, no kind of make you jump out your skin type splash moves, even though I did kind of get really excited earlier this morning when I seen we signed uh, Quentin Jefferson. But just talk about the moves that he's made 
you know, from Monday to now and how you assess those moves? What kind of grade would you give Andrew Berry right now? Well, I think the thing that people should keep in mind is that the Browns could walk out there today and they have one of the best rosters, if not the best roster in all of football. The biggest acquisition that they're going to have is returning Deshaun Watson and returning Nick Chubb, right? There was no signing they were going to make that was going to be any bigger than that. I know it, the urge is when you see other teams get all these shiny new pieces, you're wondering, like, where's your shiny stuff? Like, you want to go on Amazon and order a package just because everybody else getting some stuff sent to them, right? <laughs> exactly. like, you got enough at the house, right? And that's where the Browns are. They got a lot at the house. Like, I can, Deshaun Watson, I know people maliciously bring up his $230 million contract all the time. But to be fair, if you look at this roster, you think, hey, a guy that's a franchise quarterback, this is a Super Bowl roster, right? Like, mm -hmm. if, if he's a franchise quarterback, this is a roster you can expect a Super Bowl behind. Like, yeah, is there a couple flaws here? The defensive tackle room, you would like another starter in there. Um, but that's not. Uh, you can't win a championship because of it whole, right? They don't have any of those. If Nick Chubb comes back to full strength, um, then you really have nothing there that you can just point to as like, oh, they can't get over the hump because of this. Baltimore, I mean, they almost beat Pat Mahomes with like, what, Zay Flowers was their best receiver last year? So, yeah. you know, this roster, like, we can pick at it because we're here and we look at it every day and, and talk about what we don't have as much as we want. But this roster right here is about as good as it gets for a team. Um, especially if you feel like, and you're paying somebody to be a franchise quarterback. And I think that's the important thing to keep in perspective is that this is a team that feels like they have enough already and that they're pretty much set, right? Like we'll get another wide receiver because we saw that pop up as a problem. Um, you know, we'll 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 add some depth around the edges and we'll probably get another D tackle or something like that. But as far as like these big overhaul type moves, they were never gonna make those because this isn't a team that needs a starter at any position almost. Like this is a team that's pretty much set. They have starters and all pro players littered all over this roster. Um, in a way that most other NFL rosters aren't. And you look at teams like San Francisco, they're not signing anybody big, right? They've got mm -hmm. one of the best rosters in football. They haven't done it for like the last two years. Last big move they made was for Christian McCaffrey. That was a trade during the middle of the season. When you have a roster like the Cleveland Browns, you're not going to be in that first week of free agency, we need to get somebody to play here. I'm going to throw 27 over two at DJ Reader, or I'm going to throw 27 a year at Christian Wilkins. Like, you're at the points where it's like, you don't need the big, like that big piece. Like, what's that going to do? Make your defensive line unstoppable? Yes, but you have Miles Garrett. You have Zadarius Smith. You have these pieces, and you should be able to do what you need to do with that. So, you know, I, I think this is a new spot for Cleveland Browns fans, especially of the last 20 years, where we look at our roster and we're not thinking we need a starter here. We need a starter here. We need a hit on the first round pick or else we might not win seven games. This team won, t what, 11 games last yeah. year and 26 percent of the salary cap was on injured reserve. That tells you how how deep that roster is and how good that roster. We were down to D. Anthony Bell in a playoff game. And nobody talks about that, right? We were down to DeAnthony Bell and Ronnie Hickman in a playoff game. Them dudes showed up and showed up, Joe Flacco throwing the ball and Amari Cooper on limited snaps. And people like act like we should have just ran through that game, right? Like, that's how good the roster is. So that that's just where they're at. They could get that low on their depth chart and still be a good defense, still have the expectations of being a dominant defense. Um, and when you're that level of, of roster, you just ain't going to make that many moves. And you've done it. You've done the free agency moves. Big facts, big facts, man. We got almost 400 people watching this. We got Quincy Carrier in the building. Shout out to everybody that's watching this right now. Make sure you like, uh, and subscribe to the ultimate Cleveland sports show. Make sure you go over to Quincy's page, man. Like subscribe. If you haven't already, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, man, we're going to have a quick conversation about Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy spoke to the media today. Uh, gonna throw up a quote that he had to say, and we're gonna react to it. That's coming up next on the Ultimate 216 Show. And, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, man, catch all the Ultimate Spinoff shows, man, the Ultimate Guardian Show, the Ultimate Brown Show with my man G Bush. You can always see Quincy pulling up on G every now and then. 
um, the Ultimate Cash Show with Mikey McNuggets and Jason Lloyd. And of course, another edition of the Ultimate 216 Show will be coming at you real soon. So I'm pretty sure you see by now Jerry Judy uh, spoke to the media today. And it was three things that he thought about, that he talked about, I'm sorry, that kind of stood out to me. One was the impact that he felt like that Amari Cooper will have on his life and on his career. Two, about, you know, wanting to have a long-term home to play at and just kind of letting this season play out. And then at the very end of the press conference, he was asked about the comments that was made by uh, Steve Smith, which, of course, he never really responded to last year. But, Quincy, I'm going to take this quote real quick, and I'm going to read it. This is what he had to say to that question. I always say that I in the sky don't lie. Put on the tape, put on the film. Some games, I didn't have my best game, but I'm going to control what I can control. If you turn on the tape, turn on the film, you really can see what I'm capable of doing, even though the stats, the stats not really showing what it's saying. And that was Jerry Judy when he spoke to the media earlier today. I think the Browns got a steal in Jerry Judy. I think the Browns got a dude that got a lot of potential, a lot of upside. And I get it. The numbers didn't match the draft status or whatever the case may be. But sometimes, man, when you get a fresh start in a new environment, I think that, you know, that rose that grows from concrete becomes a real thing and not cliche. Yeah, and sometimes numbers can be affected by quarterback play. We know Russ has had his adventures trying to find the middle of the field, especially over the last couple of years. That couldn't have been something helpful for Jerry Judy, who was a slot specialist, right? Like that had to affect him. And even then, the numbers he put up were very admirable. Um, you know, I think people expect the production that, you know, that you would get out of like a Mike Evans or something because he was drafted what, in the top half of the first round. But mm -hmm. he's put up admirable numbers um i think there's room to get more out of him hell amari cooper was at a similar place not he was a little bit more than jerry judy but amari cooper was like consistently low 1000s right before he got to cleveland he gets to cleveland works with kevin stefanski and despite having relative instability at quarterback right with deshaun watson being injured or suspended most of the time amari cooper has been here amari cooper put up a career year in touchdowns the year before and a career mm -hmm. year in receiving yards this year um and he, he i mean this is the best amari cooper that anybody's ever gotten which is in cleveland uh, which is new for us, right? To trade for somebody with a big name and get the most out of them. The most out right? of them, absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, but that's what's happened with Coop. And, you know, I think something similar can happen with Judy, especially if Deshaun stays healthy because where Deshaun thrives is down the field in that slot seam area, right? Like David and Joku, his tight ends always thrive there. You know, D-Hop is somebody who can get in the slot, put some damage down. That's always been where Deshaun Watson can do some work with. Um, and Jerry Judy is the type of wide receiver that I think he could really do a lot with because he's super accurate when he's on. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen it even when in Cleveland, right? Deshaun will have balls that he throws where it looks like it got teleported into the hands of the wide receiver and they can just seamlessly run after the catch. And you put the ball in Jerry Judy's hands like that or David and Joku's hands like that, you can see where the success can be had on this offense. And a lot of the pressure's taken off of Jerry Judy, right? He was like a number two option in Denver next to Cortland Sutton. Now, I mean, teams are going to be worried about Amari Cooper first, David and Joku second. They're going to check what's going on with Chubb. And then they're going to look for you and Elijah Moore. Right. Well, so there's going to be some matchups that you're going to get. Teams aren't going to be so focused on you and trying to make sure they put you in the exact type press situation that you don't like. Right. They're not going to be focused on making you uncomfortable. They're focused on making those guys uncomfortable, which means you got a lot of room to get comfortable and, and, and get some production there. So I think this would be a good move. You didn't really risk much. You traded what you got for Baker Mayfield and what you got for trading for Deshaun Watson. So. I mean, you could just basically pair that up with the Deshaun Watson trade. And if these two have a great year, now all of a sudden that trade goes from worst quarterback trade of all time to an absolute bargain if you get a good wide receiver and a franchise quarterback for three first round picks. Yeah, I seen that tweet when you put it out there. And I, I love how like you kind of like triggered the thought process of people because you even dropped the tweet under the tweet. Like for those who need the context, <laughs> this is what it is. And, and I think it does set up to say, OK, when this thing comes full circle, you know, this will ultimately determine 
you know, if, if this trade was a success or not. I think one of the things that I really like about it is this is a dude who ran a 4 4 at the combine. He's not a little dude, he's six foot one. Um, not only does he have speed, but he actually is a route running assassin, right? And I think that in most cases, you get dudes who have one or the other. You either get dudes who's really, really fast or dudes who's really, really good at running routes. And Jerry Judy, quite honestly, is one of the few who, who has the speed to take the top off the defense and can, like, shake you up with the routes. When you talk about 40-plus yard reception since 2022, he has 10, Amari has 12. And you talk about this offense being more of an air raid type of offense, more of a vertical type passing game. You know, it'd be really, really interesting to see a motivated Jerry Judy kind of step up and show out. You know, we are he's entering the contract year. Elijah Moore's entering the contract year. Omari will be entering the contract year. So this is huge for Deshaun. And this is huge years for all three of those wide receivers who's looking to get paid. Yeah, because if Elijah Moore and Jerry Judy have good years then you can see how they can just cycle this in, right? Okay, we'll put Cedric Tillman here. We'll move Jerry Judy over to where Amari Cooper is. We can keep Elijah Moore at that, like, number two second wide uh, situation. So, yeah, it, there's a lot of room for, for guys to get paid. Um, it's going to be weird to see because, like, if Amari Cooper and Jerry Judy both ball out, they're going to go with the younger guy, right? Like, so is hopefully Amari gets his money somewhere else. But – yeah, there's a lot of money to be had in that room. Um, and if you're Deshaun, you got to take advantage of it this year. You got to stay healthy. Got to do what you can to make sure they can eat, um, win from that pocket so you can get as far as you can. Because, I mean, the weapons that you have on this offense, it would only be – it would be less ridiculous if we didn't have this defense too, right? Like, I think that's another thing. Like, since we have this defense, we tend to think of the offense as kind of an afterthought. But mm -hmm. think about how little it took offensively for this team to win games last year, right? Like PJ right. Walker went two and one um, with right. this team, and it wasn't like he you know was that's Tyus' favorite out. player, right? Huh? You know that's Tyus Powell's favorite player. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. grinder, <laughs> grinder. But you know, it, it was it's something. There is something about that, right? Where you're able to win games, like you know, I know people make it about Joe Flacco, but the Browns won games with four different quarterbacks last year. That's how good this defense is. If the offense can just meet it somewhere in the middle, if they could just be like a top 10, 12 offense, and you got something there. I mean, that's pretty Kansas City Chiefs-like, right? Where the Kansas City Chiefs had the best defense in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And then offensively, they didn't really put together any crazy games, but they were good enough to be in the top half of all those teams playing. And that's it. That's all they needed, right, to get past everybody because you need that balance to win a Super Bowl, right? And the Browns are addressing special teams this year. They're bringing back D-Hop. They have the punters and everything else. Defense, we know that's going to be solid. Now we just need to get this passing game where it needs to. Also, you got Nick Chubb who's sitting in the lair. And look, if Nick Chubb's 80% back, that's better than like 90% of the NFL. Man, big facts, big facts. So listen, man, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we got 514 people watching. Again, shout out to y'all. A couple more minutes with Quincy. If you got any questions for Quincy, drop them in this uh, chat. Of course, Super Chats get read first. We're going to answer those questions, man. Chop it up with him for a few more minutes. Uh, get Quincy out of here. And then, of course, man, we I want to have a con conversation about mental health before we wrap up. But of all, as always, Make sure you are subscribed to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Ring the bell. Hit the like button. Stay in the know of everything that's going on. Now, we going live as soon as possible. Anytime the Cleveland Browns make a move, Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, man, your one-stop shop for everything Cleveland sports. So, Quincy, my man, uh, this is the first time me and you really worked together. I know I've tried to work with you a couple times. I've been in this game for about three and a half years. This will be my fourth year. I followed your content for a while. Like, what's your message to people who want to do what you're doing and they don't really see the immediate payoff or the immediate gratification? Because I remember producing on the radio, I think two seasons ago, when the Browns invited you to training camp. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I've really seen, like, you, your, your work pay off. What would your message be to those people? Uh, I think it's just about making sure you find what you want to do and figure out what you want to do with that. Right. Like that's been my whole thing. My entire life is okay. I went to college. I want to learn how to do film. Right. But mm -hmm. we didn't have a film program at the college I went to. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna join film club. I'm gonna find a way to get 
access to a DSLR so I can learn how to use that. Then I'm going to, you know, try to get some scholarships to be able to afford a camera and be able to make my own projects and stuff like that. Um, there's always going to be reasons to not be able to do something. I think you have to be creative. And, and, like if you want to do something, you just got to be creative and be willing to compromise a little bit to what it can look like. Um, I think sometimes we get in this zone of I want like I know so many people that want to start a YouTube channel. I'm like, OK, you right. gonna start it. And they're like, no, nah, I want to get the camera right. I want to get the mic right. I want to make sure that I got this background set up and this and that. I want to make sure I got an editor. It's like, well, it don't come pre-built. Like you got to build it right. Like this is the, <laughs> there's no get a, a a a content creator pack from target that you could just buy set up one day you good like you're gonna have to just go out here and do it because you're gonna get all that camera all that equipment you don't know what you're doing with it right you don't know what your flavor is you don't know what it is that you're trying to package and sell what that people would want to watch if you're putting stuff out there and that's what it was for me i just wanted to talk browns so i started making videos about the browns um you know colin coward was saying something crazy i responded to it and then i kept making videos every week and then you find your voice i think it took me like what four years into this to really find where my voice is and where my where i sit naturally at um in this space and where i can grow and i'm still continuing to go on that process so that that's my best piece of advice is just if you have something you want to do find a way for you to do it now right like right. if you want to get back into the gym i know you got a million different it might be something as simple as like Back in the day, like people get on We Fit or something like that because they can't get to the gym. But there's always a way to get it done. You just got to be willing to do it in whatever way is possible that you can access it. And then you can keep doing that until you can access more. Like you just got to just gotta find a way. You know, that's the toughest thing, especially, you know, it uh, in certain areas of Cleveland that we are all familiar with. You know, it's not always the opportunity isn't always there. Sometimes you got to do what you can to make it. And I'm not saying just because you hustle hard, it's going to happen, but it has a better shot of happening, right? <laughs> like if you try, then if right. you don't, and so many people, this is uh, my last story I'll get out before I, before I go too long. In college, I remember thinking, I can't get no scholarship, right? I grew up in Maple Heights. I wasn't a great student in high school. My second year in college, I'm just happy I'm in college still, right? Like I was just happy to not flunk out. And my, my advice is like, you can, you can, you can go for these scholarships. And he just told me to fill out all these scholarships, right? Shout out to Mike Bev. He told me, just fill out these scholarships. I promise, just fill them out. I filled out these scholarships. I went to the application. I ended up winning like 12 of them because nice. so many people talk themselves out of filling out that application that it really wasn't that many people going for it that nice, is life nice. right that is life so many people will talk themselves out of really going for something that if you go for it you don't have a hundred percent chance i'm not gonna sit here and lie but you do have a shot if you go for it and you can feel comfortable and go to sleep even if you fail that you went for it right like hey i went for it it didn't work out on to the next but if you don't go for it, when you had the chance to, you're always going to be thinking about that. So that's what I always think about is how how many people told themselves, well, I can't get no scholarship. So why fill out the application? Because Real quick, bro. Because everybody else is. No, no, facts. Because I echo that. You know what I'm saying? You got to at least make the attempt. You know, I've said before, if I got one opportunity to look up from my grave before they threw dirt on top of my casket, would I be satisfied with the life that I live? Did I at least try to do everything that I wanted to do in my life. And if the answer is no, then that's a life that was unsuccessful. So I echo everything you said, bro. Um, really, really enjoyed your time, man. Really enjoyed you taking time out your busy schedule to spend some time with me. Hopefully we can do some more crossover work in the future, bro. Much love, respect, man. Peace and blessings. Keep grinding, man. Be great. Spread love. All that good stuff, bro. And I'm here anytime you need me, man. Definitely, definitely, bro. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being on, man. I appreciate you. That's Quincy Carrier, everybody, man. That was on the Ultimate 216 show. We're going to take one last break. When we come back, man, I want to have a serious conversation with y'all based on something that I've seen uh, from John Wall. But first, make sure you subscribe to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Ring the bell. Stay in the know. Hit the like button, man. You never know when that content is coming your way. So I seen this like the other day ago. And just stay with me. I know most of y'all was here to say to see Quincy, but I kind of need y'all to stay with me with this real quick. So we only got like three or four minutes. Um, I seen this video of John Wall 
and John Wall was speaking on mental health and his own personal battles with mental health. I'm a person that's had some battles with mental health. So I take these opportunities to put out a good word because I am a thorough believer that we might smile every day. You know, we might show up and, and fake it every day. But behind closed doors, all of us is probably battling something. All of us got something on our mind that's really, really messing with us, right? I want to play this video. And just to give you some, some, some context to it, John's, John Wall's mother passed away in 2019 from breast cancer. And he talks about that his mom's death, plus a lot of the injuries that he suffered after signing that $170 million deal with the uh, Washington Wizards really like put him in the quote unquote darkest moment of his life. So take a listen to this and I just want to react to it real quick. Like I still got our same phone number saved. I text it yes, every morning. Me too. I call it. I used to talk to my mom five, six times a day. So I know how it is and I'm trying to tell people mental health is serious. So I had to go yes. get a therapist after that. Yeah, me too. Like if it wasn't for my two boys, I got put a in my head twice. Ooh. And a lot of people that's close to me and my friends at the time didn't know. And uh, not to branch off, but you know what I mean? Like I had a video came out throwing up gang signs and stuff like that. That's when I was in my darkest moment, mm -hmm. trying to figure out to find Hold happiness. Go, go back, go back though. You said you had a in your head? Yeah. I mean, if I take myself away from this earth, I'm, I'm failing my kids. Like yeah. who's gonna be able to raise yeah. them? That was courtesy of the OG's podcast, man. Listen, that took a lot of courage. You know, I remember I lost my dad April 4th of 2018. And I remember like just scrambling, trying to figure out who the hell I was and how life was going to look going forward. And it's not like that now, but for a long time, anything that happened prior to 4-4-2018 seemed like a blur to me. You know, I really didn't really have a good recollect of anything that had happened throughout life. My message to anybody is, man, when you lose a parent, when you when you lose anybody that's really, really close to you, the weight sometimes can get to a point to where it feels unbearable, to where it feel like you want to give up, you want to quit, and that your life is no longer worth it because the people that's in your life is no longer here, right? And my message to you would be that I'm not going to lie and say that the pain of losing a parent ever goes away. The truth of the matter is, it's like a heavy ass weight that you just adjust on how you carry that weight day in and day out. For a long time, and I wanted to walk around being an imitation of my dad instead of just being the best version of Earl that I could be. And then when I started to peel back those layers and realizing that I just want to be Earl, like I would find myself depressed because the things that I'm doing now, after being a knucklehead my whole life, He's not here in a physical sense to see. Day in and day out, man, I do whatever I can to heal myself, whether it be therapy, whether it be my spiritual walk, et cetera. And so I just want to encourage people who are going through something um, to not give up, to keep the faith, to keep the hope, to stay encouraged, to know that better days is ahead, to know that storms don't last forever and that somebody in this world loves you and they need you around. So whatever it is, man, pick your chin up, King. Pick your chin up, queen, and journey forward. This has probably been one of my favorite episodes of the Ultimate 216 Show. I want to thank Quincy once again, man, for taking time out his busy day and joining me on the show. I want to thank over 500 people who pulled up, showed us some love, man. Till next time, don't forget, I love you all. Remember, be great, spread love. Being great, come with a price. Spread love is priceless. I'm out of here, man. Mm -hmm.